From the SABC's Auckland Park headquarters, welcome to this evening's live episode of The Watchdog. My name is Vuyam Vogo, and here's what we have in store for you this evening. First, we look at uh, that call President Ramaphosa placed to his Russian counterpart after each one of them afterwards had rather interesting, if not in part confusing, accounts of the virtual meeting. And at the end of a trying week for the nation on the electricity front, our second panel looks at whether there are any immediate solutions, even if it's just to cushion the blow. All that coming up in this Friday's edition of The Watchdog, which starts now. President Ramaphosa took to Twitter um, last night to disclose that uh, he had made a call uh, to his Russian counterpart, Vladimir Putin. Thanking Putin for taking his call, he said he wanted to gain an understanding of uh, the situation unfolding between Russia and Ukraine. I outlined our position on the conflict as well as our belief that the conflict should be resolved through mediation and negotiation between the parties and, if need be, with the help of agencies that can help bring a solution to the conflict. President Putin's account was a rather peculiar um, one. In a statement, his office um, says that the two presidents had a conversation about the 30th um, anniversary um, of diplomatic relations between Russia and South Africa, as well as expanding trade. And I quote from the statement, the Kremlin statement that is, the leaders reaffirmed their commitment to further develop the bilateral strategic partnership, noting in particular their readiness to expand trade, economic and humanitarian cooperation and joint COVID-19 response efforts, the statement said. Uh, the statement continues, at the request of President Cyril Ramaphosa, the president of Russia spoke about the reasons for and goals of the special military operation to protect Donbass. He also informed the South African leader about the situation regarding talks with representatives of the Ukrainian authorities. The president of South Africa supported the ongoing political and diplomatic efforts. Vladimir Putin and Cyril Ramaphosa agreed to continue their contacts, the Kremlin statement added. Well, to help us make sense of this development, please welcome activist and social commentator Veli Mbele. Yesterday, he delivered a paper at the Nelson Mandela University on the implications of this Russia-Ukraine conflict on global politics. John Sremlau is an international relations professor with Wurz University. He's been on the program a couple of times before and he's been with this story um, since the very first day. Good evening, gentlemen, to both of you and thank you so much for agreeing to be part of this conversation. Thank you for the invitation. If I may start with you, Professor Sremla, I don't know what uh, you made of um, the president's tweets and everything contained therein. Well, I take the point that uh, is often made by President Ramaphosa that peace talks really are essential to move beyond this horrific conflict that is daily uh, splashing across all of the social media and serious newspapers of the world about uh, the uh, humanitarian crises that uh, the Ukrainian people have underwent, uh, undergoing. And um, my only question is, is it feasible to have a peace 
negotiation. And I think that it, it may well be now that the costs of this conflict to Vladimir Putin are a lot higher than I think he ever imagined. And Zelensky was really underestimated the president of, of Ukraine and the people's resistance in Ukraine. Is there an off-ramp? I, I think President Ramaphosa, better than anyone in the world, would know how to find one if the one exists, but he needs support. And I would therefore hope that the Chinese might see it in their wisdom, given the threat that this whole conflict poses to the global economy on which China is so engaged and so dependent, uh, that they might indeed help give resolve to Vladimir Putin. And I just stress again that probably Cyril Ramaphosa, I know he's been criticized for not talking to Zelensky and the Ukrainians, but Nelson Mandela reminded us that there is no one more dangerous than someone who has been humiliated. And I think that Vladimir Putin has taken identity politics to a, 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 an nth degree here with regard to his desire to overcome the humiliation of the loss of the last empire, the Soviet Union, and that Russia does not have anything like parity again as a major power. And somehow you've got to find a way to overcome that sense of humiliation, but it's going to be a very, very tough pull. Veli, what did you make of uh, uh, President Ramaphosa's tweets? Yes. Um, well, first, it must be seen in the context of a number of things. Um, uh, historically, right, the, the position of uh, the, the liberation movements, right, uh, in South Africa and across the continent and their relationship with the USSR. So that is not something that is going to uh, escape the memory, right, of, uh, of the liberation movements in Africa. The second issue is it is also important for us to remember uh, how South Africa voted in the recent um, vote at the UN Security Council on this matter. But what is also important, and I think not many of us paid attention to this, um, the, uh, the elaboration that South Africa published, right, to explain the rationale behind its decision. One of the important things that South Africa pointed out, which is missing in the... Uh, the, the, the global discourse is the fact that the latest resolution that the UN took did not make much room for a diplomatic solution. And if you look at the posture of that resolution, it resembled the resolution that the UN took uh, in relation to uh, Libya, right, which suggested that it seemed to have been a resolution that was calculated to create an atmosphere to justify another invasion, right? So for me, that context is important in understanding uh, the position that um, uh, President Ramaphosa announced, but also the fact that um, this is a BRICS partner of South Africa. So uh, the engagement that they would have had, had uh, would, would only make sense, right? Uh, so, so it makes a lot of sense. And I think the approach that President um, Ramaphosa took, in my view, was very sensible. Uh, Prof, I mean, going to, um, you know, uh, the Kremlin's account um, uh, of that meeting, uh, here's something I found rather peculiar. I mean, we're talking about a crisis here uh, that has, you know, affected the entire world. And one wonders what the point was of talking about the 30th anniversary, uh, you know, of diplomatic relations between Russia and South Africa, expanding trade, uh, bilateral strategic partnership, uh, and the readiness to expand trade and economy. What, in your view, would have been the point of going through all of that when everyone knows that what we'll be focusing on now, you know, is, is, is the crisis at hand? Well, I've, I've learned enough over the last uh, couple of months to not to trust anything that uh, at, at face value, not to take anything at face value that uh, that, that Putin uh, articulates. Uh, after all, it was ironic that he's celebrating 30 years of independence for South Africa when, in fact, uh, Belarus, uh, Ukraine became a member of the um, 
uh, UN and had its so sovereignty recognized at that time, and it gave up its nuclear weapons as South Africa did uh, under an agreement and understanding that Russia would never intrude on the uh, Republic of, of Ukraine. And yet after the Orange Revolution, uh, and the 1914, um, uh, the 2014 uh, expulsion of Putin's puppet. Then they they annexed Crimea and they started this festering uh, war in the eastern region of Donbas. And I, I just think that there may be an element here of of a possible off ramp for Putin, and that's really the preoccupation. That must be President Ramaphosa's preoccupation. And by the way, you know he called. Putin after having um, pushed aside this enormous uh, nuclear deal that Jacob Zuma and the, and the, and the Guptas had noted, negotiated with the oligarchs and the Russian uh, uh, company that Putin founded. And so it, it was very courageous, I think, and useful for President Ramaphosa to reach out. But I reiterate again, he needs help and support because it is going to be very, very difficult for Putin to back down, and that's what I think all the noise was in the tweet that you're referring to, because basically he has told Macron, the president of France, and everyone else that he's just, and, and his behavior seems to confirm this, he's just escalating the siege of Kiev and Lviv and other towns, and the Maripol catastrophe in the south is just horrific, and today there were reports that he's been bombing uh, his planes have been bombing in, 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 the, in the western region, which is, those towns have been fairly uh, uh, unscathed so far. So, so this is the time to really push. I'm very glad that Ramaphosa is pushing, but I don't think we can take either of the communications too seriously because there's uh, an awful lot going on below the surface, uh, one would assume, uh, in terms of w why President Ramaphosa felt emboldened to do this. I take the point... Uh, that that um, uh, Vera made about um, the support that uh, uh, Russia has um, among others of the BRICS, but the but the BRICS were divided in that vote in the UN with Brazil voting yes and Russia voting no, and then it was India, China, and South Africa that abstained. And the Americans have been very generous. They said, you know, better to abstained abstained than to have voted uh, against it. And I think they want to still continue, the Americans still want to continue to have a good relationship with South Africa. The Chinese want to have a good relationship with South Africa. Uh, the Russians do too. So um, I just think that South Africa on its own probably doesn't have the leverage to get Putin to find a face-saving formula. But I think the Chinese do have leverage over him. They're 10 times the size of his economy. And he is completely uh, uh, dependent on them right now for so much that is, uh, is in his crippled economy. And, and, and I think the Chinese are getting very, very uneasy about what this conflict means for the global economy. Uh, Veli, I mean, while President uh, Ramaphosa makes mention of uh, an approach and BRICS, um, interestingly, the... Russians aren't mentioning that at all. They're talking about that history of relations and all of that, and then talk about um, President Putin giving President Ramaphosa the context, saying, why did we do this and this is where things are? And not a mention, you know, of, 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 uh, you know, of, uh, of the conversation around mediation um, or even, let yes. alone their stance. Um, well, if that was to be, well, to be the case. Yes. Seems to be ready for mediation, but, but I, I just want to make a, 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 another, another point that, that uh, it really is um, a, a moment to take a, a reassessment of how much he has taken advantage of the humiliation that the Russians felt they um, uh, had when the Soviet Union collapsed. They lost that status. And then NATO expansion occurred. And that's a very controversial subject, but that I think that's his focus right now. Okay. His focus is on Europe. His focus is on the pride of the Russian people. He's ridden that to power and sustained himself in power, and now is going to be uh, reelected uh, unless unless there is an insurrection on the on the on the horizon within Russia. And I don't see that happening. He's closed down all freedom of speech. 
and all, all uh, uh, freedom of the press. So uh, it, it's a very tricky situation right now, and I, I should let Vera speak. Hi, Vili. Or, or do you think I'm yes, reading too uh, much into, into the fact that uh, the Russians make no mention whatsoever of um, the mediation um, um, uh, um, effort that uh, President Ramaphosa referred to? First, first you must remember, um, from an international relations point of view, countries have got different strategic priorities. So what they often communicate uh, after they have had bilaterals is informed by what their strategic priorities are. But it doesn't mean that the fact that they may not have mentioned BRICS, they, uh, BRICS was not necessarily uh, in the conversation or that it is not something important. But I just want to say that... Uh, Quickly, I find the the line of argument of the of the professor very interesting because the line of argument of the professor seems to perpetuate the narrative that the main problem here is Putin, right? And um, does not speak. For instance, he refers to a president that was le illegally removed in 2014 as Putin's puppet, right? Now, the president was illegally removed, and everybody who seems to be perpetuating the narrative that the professor is perpetuating, does not talk about the fact that whether or not the person was a puppet, the person was removed illegally. But also, what is also not spoken about is the fact that there are Ukrainians, right, Russian-speaking Ukrainians, who want to become part of Russia, and they have a right to do so under international law. Now, since 2014, right, they have been under serious attack, right, from a government that has got over 10,000 right-wing elements in its National Guard, and they committed their fair share of atrocities even before we got here. So there has been a civil war that has been raging in the Ukraine, and the Ukraine has been portrayed, right, as uh, an innocent party here, but it is also important to reflect on their own contribution here. And I sense this, this, this perpetuation of uh, Vladimir Putin as being the central problem, for me, is deeply disingenuous, right? And um, the other thing to understand here is also that you can't talk about what is happening uh, in uh, between Russia and um Ukraine and not implicate the United States, right? And not implicate the United States in violating all known and conceivable international conventions over the years, right? Because to not implicate the United States and to not even implicate Ukraine, right? Especially since 2014, is an unbalanced and disingenuous way of looking what is happening here. And this is why I said, in my view, President Ramaphosa's intervention is very sensible because it is balanced and it is not playing to the dominant Western narrative of, of Putin being portrayed as this monster. And I'm sensing the same in our conversation here. Is that where you were, Prof? Excuse me? Is what uh, Aveli is saying, is, 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 it, is, it, is it where you are on this matter? Well, my, my, my defense is that um, let the people of Ukraine have a plebiscite. That's a good African solution to the problem. And they will vote as they have in 2014. Namely, the parliament agreed that they would join the European Union voluntarily. And the president then, who was uh, a, a creature of Moscow, uh, overruled that and denied it. So you can talk about legalities or illegalities. The politics of it was that most of the former Soviet Union rushed to embrace NATO and the Western European Union. They were tired of uh, imperial control that the Russian people didn't feel was justified. And I think the humiliation that the Russian people felt and that Putin has exploited should be addressed. 
it, 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 it makes sense to have a, 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 a negotiator like Cyril Ramaphosa, who, after all, managed to get uh, the enemies in South Africa to become adversaries in a peaceful and transparent way. And the democracy has resulted. Uh, I thought that, that Martin Kamani, the Kenyan ambassador at the UN, said it very well uh, uh, about a week and a half ago when he diagnosed the problem from an African perspective where communities transcend artificial frontiers that have been drawn but are respected and the sovereign equality and territorial integrity is a fundamental principle of international order. We all know that. The U.S. violates it, sure. Other people violate it, sure. But we ought to call all of them out. And uh, what I think Wamaposa is doing is trying to find whether or not there is a face-saving way for Putin to back down. He's the one who has invaded. He's the one who's broken the, 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 the rules and, and he did it so when he in annex Crimea, and he did so again now. That's now. Um, to do the what is what as what aboutisms? You know, we can all argue about the history, including NATO expansion, which I thought was probably ill-advised because it just read salt in the wounds. But the uh, the former Soviet republics wanted to join NATO, and they met the criteria, and so they applied, and they were accepted. But that's now a water under the dam. Uh, Veli, but is there, I mean, what are the chances um, of uh, what President Ramaphosa seems to have started? Um, and if, I mean, with, uh, together with his uh, 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 BRICS, you know, counterparts, what are the chances of this, him or BRICS? collectively making some inroads on the back of what Prof calls the humiliation um, of, uh, of, uh, of Vladimir Putin? Well, look, um, the, the first thing to also understand here is that the efforts that President Ramaphosa is undertaking, right, come in an atmosphere where the narrative that is pushed by people like the U.S. president is the dominant narrative, right? And everybody uh, who thinks uh, they, they have an opinion, you know, finds themselves leaning towards that narrative. And it is uh, an overwhelming just, 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 narrative okay, can because I, can, can even I the you, mainstream... Can, can, can I start right there? Because I, 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 was, I was trying to avoid this conversation going back to, you know, who was wrong and who was right, where this all started, because I was trying to sort of narrowly focus for the purposes of this conversation on what President Ramaphosa told or says he told Vladimir Putin and what the Kremlin um, said um, is it's what they spoke about and not the basis of the little admittedly you know not everything was said I mean, it's the nature of these things you know but on the on the on the on the basis of the little that we know from the statement the kremlin statement and president ramaphosa's tweets reading between the lines what are the chances that president ramaphosa and his BRICS counterparts can even vaguely make some inroads okay thanks so the first thing we must do from an african perspective is that we must first endorse right the call that has been made by south africa that this matter should be resolved through dialogue and mediation. That is the call which I think we must echo and um, we must magnify. Secondly, uh, like I said earlier, in, 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 especially if you take things from Twitter, uh, when I'm um, in how bilateral discussions, especially during a time of conflict, are communicated, you are bound to have um, communication that may not necessarily consistent with what you would have expected, right? But that does not suggest that the effort to reach out, and remember this is an initial stage, the effort to reach out and start a mediation process itself may not yield results. And for me, I think it's an initial effort. And if there are communication concerns at this stage, I don't think we must magnify them. But I do think given the broader problem of superpower domination, it is important that we echo the position that South Africa took, which is to call for mediation 
uh, on this issue. And I think that should be our approach, and we should not read much, in my view, into whether the communication was um, consistent from both sides. There's a bigger context which helps us to understand why the communication was in that way, in my view. Uh, Prof, quick last word from you. Um, is China, which uh, the only ingredient, uh, a, an off-ramp, as you call it, uh, would need for it to succeed? I mean, for I a, can't for, for, speak for China, but I, I think that it's really important for us to bear in mind that South Africa cannot make progress on its own alone. It either implicitly or explicitly needs to be part of uh, more of an international community than the five countries that voted no at the UN General Assembly, namely Russia, Belarus, North Korea, Eritrea, and Syria. We, we've, we've got to see uh, a, a, a snowballing effect, and I think that South Africa has the international standing to be the agent for some of this, but it really needs to be backstopped by the Chinese. And I think the Chinese are, 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 are now seriously worrying that Putin has overplayed his hand and the catastrophe occurring in, the, um, in, in, in Ukraine, the humanitarian catastrophe could escalate and get us into a real problem of nuclear confrontation. And that's where we're going to leave it for tonight. Special thanks to Professor uh, Stremlau and Veli Mbele. Well, there hasn't been a shortage of responses from South Africans um, to President Ramaphosa's tweets. Let's bring up um, a few of them. African Lion uh, says, uh, we have bigger problems in South Africa. How about you update us with regards to the 500 billion that went missing? How about we get an update with regards to load shedding or an update with regards to better housing for our people or employment for graduates? Uh, Naked Zebra says, do South Africa even realize that Russia does not even feature in the top five main trade partners who are the European Union, China, US, Japan and India? South Africa to get 8.5 billion US from uh, the United States, EU and UK to speed up shift from coal benefits to uh, 241 million euros for EU development funding. Let's see if we can take a couple more. Um, Elvera says, can you please focus on our country? Load shedding, potholes, unemployment and the petrol prices put South Africa first. Bongwe says, Cyril Ramaphosa, Tinangapa, Mr. President, we are receiving our RIP because of the vaccines that you imposed on us. Even our companies were lawfully terminating our contracts if we refused to take the jab. Can we at least get those government jobs so would we die with decent jobs? At least. Magadla says, petrol, Mr. President, what about petrol? Please make a better deal with him so that he can sell us oil at a cheaper cost so that petrol won't be so expensive. Last one uh, for this round, there were many. Uh, PT, Selwyn says, PT, you don't start out the problems. And the mess is your own country first. I suppose that's in. Before getting involved in strife on the other side of the world. Shows where your interest and loyalties lie. Obviously not with South African citizens and this country. Wow. There were indeed lots and lots. That's only a handful uh, of the tweets we could um, read here on the program tonight. But lots and lots of responses to President's tweets. But Ukraine's ambassador to South Africa, Lyubov Abravitova, says President Cyril Ramaphosa has not called Ukrainian president as he did Russian with the Russian president. Earlier, President Ramaphosa announcing, as we have been telling you, that he called Putin to discuss Russia's involvement invasion of Ukraine. The DA, the official opposition, has now called for the president to get Ukraine's side of the story as well. Side by side, 
the DA and the Ukraine's ambassador addressing the media outside parliament. The official opposition says it wants to show solidarity with Ukraine and the party has also slammed South Africa's decision to abstain from voting in the United Nations General Assembly on the Russian invasion in Ukraine. South Africa had argued that the UN resolution did not create an environment conducive for diplomacy, dialogue and mediation. We are experiencing huge war crimes. South Africa cannot sit on the fence in this case, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm uh, really embarrassed at the stance taken by South Africa uh, at the United Nations General Assembly. I don't think, as Dante said, that in the, you know, the hottest places in hell are reserved for those who, in times of great moral crisis, uh, choose neutrality. You can't be neutral in this particular situation, and the moral equivalence that the South African government is trying to set out between Ukraine and the Russian Federation is like an elephant standing on a mouse, and then you want to blame the mouse for being aggressive with the elephant. The DA says it will continue to highlight the human rights violations in Ukraine as the conflict will lead to higher cooking oil and grain prices. The party has called for a parliamentary debate on the Russia-Ukraine war, which will take place next week on Tuesday. Ulilani Philip, SABC News, Parliament. After the break, ASCOM's problems don't look like they are going to be over anytime soon. What are the alternatives? Uh, how do we cushion the blow? Well, what is realistically possible? Our panel weighs in on those questions. That's after this short break. Welcome back. Well, with ASCOM's problems uh, seemingly not going to end anytime soon, do we have options or what can be done in the time we have? Are there shortcuts and uh, what are the dangers of uh, those shortcuts? Are there alternatives? How soon can those alternatives come on stream? These are conversations we've been having for a very long time, but in a week like we've had, um, you know, we thought uh, we should at least go back to some of those and to help us um, is Lebu Lishabane, who is the CEO of IX Engineers, as well as Andrew Kenny, who is an energy engineer and independent energy commentator. Uh, good evening to both of you, and thank you so much um, uh, for your time. Uh, you know, uh, when we started thinking about you know this this conversation, albeit it's, going, it's not going to be a a, a a a long and extended one, it was on the back of uh, me picking up. Um, you'll recall that there was talk of uh, you know big mining companies and companies like your Sassols and so on are uh, going to be able to you know generate up to 100 megawatts you know of um, you know electricity without needing a license and how this was going to help and so on only to find out you know uh, that has hardly even started uh, happening and the person I spoke to started talking about a whole range of problems, you know, um, that uh, these players are actually experiencing before they can even start, which then brought me to like, so how do we then even, you know, begin, you know, to cushion ourselves, given what seems to be a fact that uh, ESCOM's problems are not going to disappear um, any, 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 any time soon? Lebo? Yeah, so it, it is quite a challenging one because um, we are never prepared for the unexpected. So the 100 megawatts, as much as it was announced, there, there isn't really um, an enabling um, process in place for such opportunities to come on board as quickly as possible. And um, it, it looks like government was not ready for this, mm. um, for this 100 megawatt um, initiative. And therefore, it was sort of like um, premature for the announcement when, you know, they weren't defined easy um, processes to follow for 
private sector to participate. Mm. So it leaves um, consumers quite um, stranded in having to find um, alternative solutions. But I think it's also pushing um, consumers to start looking at self-generation, mm. which we have seen um, quite a, uh, an increase in that. And um, it, it's, a, it's a matter of consumers taking their energy supply into their own hands and um, coming up with solutions or bringing in experts to a system to, you know, to put up the, you know, the right plans for, for them to self-generate. Mm -hmm. Because if everyone has to wait for ESCOM, then a lot of things won't happen because there's so much dependency on the, on the energy grid. Mm -hmm. Andrew, I mean, your thoughts, I mean, the car power ships uh, are still mired in controversy and the matter is in the courts. Independent power producers are complaining about tardiness, but also, um, you know, rules that are making it uh, uh, difficult, if not impossible for them to bring onto the grid some energy that we need, which they say, you know, they actually have the capacity and ability um, to, to generate. What's realistically possible? Well, I, I believe in the free markets. So what I'd have is not just not just 100 megawatts. Anybody should be allowed to supply as much electricity as they want, provided only that they meet technical regulations, you know, the right frequency, voltage and so forth. And all bureaucracy should be moved out of the way so this can happen as soon as possible. But it's very difficult. It's very difficult to, to, to su suddenly come up with 100 megawatts of useful electricity. Now, there's electricity on demand. It's there when you want it. You mentioned the power ships. Now, South Africa went out on bidding on those calls. Let me read it up. The Risk Mitigation Independent Power Producers Procurement Program. Hmm. They invited tenders for up to 2,000 megawatts of, of power, but some of it had to be reliable. You see, wind and solar are completely unreliable, actually useless for reliable energy. Probably the best one was these power ships that you've mentioned. They, they, they run on gas, which is a, a good fuel, which is clean, and they, they use uh, turbines, which are very reliable. So of, of those 12 bids, I think, the power ships was probably the best one. They could be installed quite quickly off, um, off three of our ports and quite soon could be putting 2,000 megawatts of useful electricity into our grid. But it's been held up with all sorts of environmental objections and all sorts of bureaucracy and red tape and so forth that seems to be bogging down not just power but the whole South African economy. Uh, what, about, what about nuclear, Andrew? Very much so. That I think that is the best way of generating electricity. We've proven it. At Kuburg, we've got the, the cheapest electricity in the land. It's very reliable. It's been running since 1984. It's very good. But the big problem is we must get new nuclear, but it's going to take time. If we say right now we're ordering a new nuclear plant, it would probably be about 10 years before the first <laughs> units came online. So nuclear, absolutely, yes. My son, nuclear is, is the best um, answer, but it's not in, not in the short term. We, we, it's going to be 10 years or so in the future. We must start planning for it right now. Um, um, they're, they're now going out for, for uh, to, to find interested bidders for 2,500 megawatts of new nuclear. They must go ahead with it. Hurry up. But I'm hearing there's all sorts of delays and red tape and hesitation and dithering. Uh, Lebo, um, what's uh, what are your thoughts on, on you know wind, solar, uh, and 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 and, uh, and nuclear? I mean, get I take the point. Andrew says, um, you know, it's going to take time uh, for any nuclear power projects to get off the ground. And we know that the mills um, of our government tends to grind very, very uh, uh, slowly. But those sources that have been punted, you know, as being one, environmentally friendly, but also easy to bring onto the grid, like your wind, your solar, and finds them to be utterly useless. Yeah, so 
Um, there's different views around the um, renewable energy program, especially wind and solar. And the only way really to bring some level of stability within the wind and solar is through um, storage. And we've been talking about the, the storage program coming on board in the near future, but the, the market is still waiting and um, ESCOM tested uh, a few of those, but they were limiting that to batteries. And, you know, it's, it's these limitations that are really um, constricting our growth and not enabling South Africa to adopt um, other new technologies that are, such as kinetic energy um, storage um, solutions, such as the energy vaults, which is completely independent of batteries. And um, if, if we can remove those restrictions and just let the market respond to what is best um, suited for, for the required storage, then South Africa can start being exposed to much wider variety in terms of storage solutions. And really, that's the only way you can bring some level of stability in renewable energy and wind. Um, I don't think they're completely useless, but um, there's ways we can make them a bit more stable. And I think Andrew's um, sentiments really, it's around the just the erratic nature of um, wind and solar that is completely dependent on weather and um, your night days are completely for, for solar, are completely um, not generating anything. So. Um, so, so I, I mean, is, is it not then? Is is not a case of the market has actually been responding, which is uh, your call, but. The problem being, it's not responding ad adequately. The responses it's coming with are erratic in nature. Is is that not the problem, or am I being way too simplistic? Yeah, look, um, it's it's a generation capacity of wind and solar. It's completely dependent on the weather. So when you've got less wind, then you generate less wind energy. And you've got rainy days, then you don't generate any solar power. Hence, the, you know, the battery solution is sort of a way of bringing the stability. So the erratic nature is it's just the generation capacity of the technologies. Um, and that can only be augmented really by, by storage. Mm. But let it come out without limitations. Uh, well, the engineer, you know, how far are we towards addressing uh, uh, that problem level of storage? Are we anywhere we near? How I many from conversations you are having with your peers and, and everyone? We haven't seen the energy round um, in the market, and there has been some promises of it being issued. So the sooner the better, like Andrew saying. Um, the, the, our problem is that we always reluctant reluctant to to bring out these um, RFPs out into market for private sector to to respond. So the sooner we we issue this out and for um, the right people to respond the better, then we can start moving towards storage because that is a quicker deployment than the gas and nuclear. Look, there's space for nuclear like Andrew's saying, but it's 10 years time, but mm. it's, it's the best technology and more stable. But gas, gas is our only transition in, in terms of the, um, the base load. There is no other transition better than gas if we can get the supply chain right. In fact, at this point, I want to bring in Mamet Lesebei, who is the Climate Justice Coalition and co-founder of uh, the Green New ASCOM campaign. Mamet, good evening. Thanks very much um, for your time. I it could, uh, this is the most appropriate time to bring you in here. You have uh, heard our panelists talking about uh, being realistic about the possible solutions that we have. And uh, some of them, are, which are clearly uh, erratic, as uh, 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 Lebu was saying, or at, like useless, as uh, Andrew is saying. Now, how... What, how do we move forward from your organization's uh, uh, perspective? Okay, I think the colleagues are missing two points. One is the fact that um, we are going to have to move away from the fossil fuels, and that is because these are resources that are finite, but also because even if we were to try to finish them, our planet will not be able to survive it, or at least human species will not survive in the conditions that are compatible with human life and human civilizations. 
So we're going to have to move away from that sooner or later. Now, the question is, is there really an energy um, sources that can replace this fossil fuel? I argue that particularly in South Africa, there's not really a case um, to argue against a potential for renewables. Firstly, we have an all-year-round sunshine in most parts of the country. Secondly, we have one of the longest coastal lines which has the potential to supply the you know, energy needs, for, I mean, electricity needs for this country. I mean, the Stellenbosch University academics have done a research to say that if we are to install a wind turbine in the shallow offshore waters in South Africa, you could theoretically generate an energy that can supply all our electricity need and more than that. So, I mean, when you say it is erratic, what do you mean? Um, where have you ever seen uh, a wind uh, not blowing in the sea? So, I do think particularly in a context of deepening poverty um, and energy poverty, where, as we are talking now, in the past decade, the price of electricity has been increasing uh, at, an, at, at uh, astronomical um, you know, uh, levels. Um, for instance, uh, as I said last week, we had had you know, uh, close to about 550% um, increase in the price of electricity. Now, we are faced with a real threat where just in the past few months alone, by the end of um, December, a, a barrel of, you know, of, 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 uh, of oil was selling 80, uh, 80 you know, dollars per barrel. Now it's at over 110, you know, um, at over 115. And there is a potential, according to J.B. Morgan's, that we could be looking at uh, over 200 um, U.S. dollar per barrel uh, if the situation in, uh, in Russia, Ukraine, continue to escalate. So this is a reality in a country where big majority of working class people are living below an upper poverty you know, line. That is about 50% of the entire population. So, so, so you reckon, so, so you reckon wind, wind turbines and water... Source of energy. Okay, so you reckon wind turbines and other, uh, I mean, your wind and solar, which you have also been panting, are a solution to our immediate problems? Yes, I mean, you, you, you look at, I mean, the choice that this government have made, right? Um, in 27, when I was at Netflix and they were selling um, the Midupi and Kusile project, they alleged that actually these projects are going to be cheaper. They could um, build them by 80 billion rands. We argue that they are understating the prices precisely so that they can be able to allow South we, Africans. We're all familiar um, with, with that history. I'm, what I'm, what I'm, I'm trying to narrow this down to, like, what do we do now? And is whatever anybody is punting a realistic solution to our problems here and now? So is that what you're saying? What the research is indicating is, as we are speaking now, a wind and, a wind and solar power is supplying electricity at 200 percent less than Midubi and Kusili. That, to me, is an immediate solution to problems of energy poverty, but also the vast, you know, resources, uh, you know, renewable. Uh, I mean, sources of renewable energy in this country. Says these are immediate solutions that we can be able to pursue on the basis of the resources that are there, combined with raw materials on the basis of which we can leverage. Uh, to make hydro, uh, hydrogen cells that uh, can be, you know, a source of batteries that we can use um, to power our vehicles and our public transport that can solve all the problems of energy in this country. Andrew, your thoughts on what uh, Mamet has just said? Well, I couldn't disagree more. Everywhere on Earth, they've tried solar and wind for grid electricity, everywhere on Earth without exception. Germany, Denmark, Australia, Britain, every, every single time they've tried it. What? The result is always the same. The price of electricity goes soaring up and up and up so that the, the people that use a lot of solar and wind have, have the most expensive electricity in the world. Denmark and Germany use a whole lot of solar and wind. They have the most expensive electricity in Europe. Uh, it's true that South Africa has got good good sun conditions in the Northern Cape, with these good sun conditions, with prize-winning solar stations, the cost of reliable electricity from those stations is over 500 cents a kilowatt hour. 
ESCOM selling price now is 111 cents a kilowatt hour. So this is over four times as expensive uh, as, as, as ESCOM for reliable power. Even unreliable power is expensive in terms of uh, terrible, useless, renewable energy independent power producers program, which has proved a staggering failure. Which is, you, can, you can see the massive erratic production of solar and wind. One of the most stupid things you ever hear people say, oh, the wind is always blowing somewhere, meaning that it's always blowing somewhere strongly enough to support a decent generation of electricity. This is complete nonsense. Over and over again in the whole of Europe, in the whole of South Africa, the wind is blowing nowhere strongly enough to provide useful electricity. Lebo, I feel very thought. strongly about this. I'm an environmentalist. So, can I just say, solar and wind are wonderful off-grid, wonderful. Mm. Solar water heating, uh, electricity remote thing, wonderful for that, but not for grid electricity. It's, it's unfair to solar and wind to use them for grid electricity. A quick last word from you, Lebo. Um, so, yeah, we are, my view really is that um, for South Africa to have sustainable power supply, um, we need to look at hybrid solutions. Um, so there's definitely a role um, for solar and wind um, to, to contribute towards the grid, um, obviously with the support of, of storage. And secondly, we, we need to start focusing on um, base load um, generation because we've been focusing mainly on uh, solar and wind, which is great. So we still need more of those, but we must start really focusing on our base load, which is the gas and the, and the nuclear rounds. They, they are in the RP, um, but they, they, they need to be, you know, issued to the market to respond. And that's the only way we can start moving towards uh, stability in the uh, power supply in South Africa. We haven't even, you know, started uh, this uh, conversation. Um, but that's all we have time for. Special thanks to our guest, Lebu Lishabane, um, uh, who is the CEO of IX Engineers, Andrew Kenny, energy engineer and independent energy commentator, as well as Mamed Roy uh, Sibay, who's a Climate Justice Coalition and co-founder Green New ESCOM uh, campaign. Well, tell us your thoughts. Do we have solutions um, to this crisis that is paralyzing our economy even further? But that's our show for this evening. To join us again on Monday, have a good night and a great weekend.